Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you tonight? Fantastic. That's always good to have a blowout. Once in a while, yeah. Back to back shutouts, eh? Yeah. Six nothing. The Edmonton Oilers over the Anaheim Ducks with the grade A shots um, and the six nothing Oilers win. 27 grade A shots for the Oilers, 13 for the Ducks. So it was a, they were shooting ducks in a gallery. And, um, yeah, the orders just dominated this game. Although the first period was a little dicey, had its moments. Bruce, this is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast. We'll go with two good things each because it was, well, there's so many good things. It's going to be fun to talk about. What's your first good thing? No, well, uh, I'm going to kind of do it in order uh, because Jack Mm -hmm. Campbell uh, Mm -hmm. is one of my good things, and he did a lot of his good thingery in the first period, although it was kind of a strange period for him. He, he came out and he was sort of having trouble, I thought, tracking pucks and controlling rebounds at the beginning, but he was stopping everything. And they bombarded him with something like 17 shots in the first. And the Oilers came out of it with a truly undeserved one nothing lead. And after they survived the first period with the undeserved lead, they just took the ducks to uh, to town for the for the final two periods, and wound up outscoring them uh, six nothing. But Anaheim kept getting their shots. They got nine in second, ten in the third, thirty six on the night. And Jack Campbell, he of the seven straight games of four or more goals against, stopped every one of those thirty six shots for a shutout. A shutout for Jack Campbell. He looked better oh, as the game went along. He did. He he. Uh, the rebound stopped spurting out. He was freezing rebounds. They were disappearing into him and not coming back out. And he was mm. uh, he was real good. So credit where due. I mean that's unexpected and that's uh, one reason why you keep playing the guy. And another reason is that Stu Skinner is coming off a back to back you know, high stress games, let's put it that way, against Vegas and Los Angeles. And there's no reason to wear that guy out in a game like this. You gotta rely on your backup goaler to get the job done. And tonight the backup goaler got the job done. And you know, if with with in spades, he got a shutout. He got second star of the game and uh uh he had a good night. So uh well done soup. Let's hope it's a sign of something good to come because uh he had well, this April now, right? He had a he had a real good January, and then he had a real tough February and a real tough March, and now it's April first, and we got uh, a new month on our hand, and maybe it's 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 uh, started something new for uh, uh, for Mr. Campbell. So uh, he's my first good thing. He made some good stops and and. Uh, uh, he stopped. I think he used every piece of his equipment to make a stop tonight. I know he got his mask rang on, on one shot, drilled him right right in the uh, headpiece, and uh, kept that out. And he had to adjust it before he stopped the next one. And like anyway, good on him. So yeah, he he every uh, every shot in the first period seemed to be an adventure with Campbell. Yes, like he he, he got lucky um, early in the game. There was a um, outside shot, and the rebound spilled to um, Strom. Um, Ryan Strom will put it off the post inside and, and, of the post, right across. Yeah, and the I thought line. Huh. I thought it was actually a pretty tough initial shot, like the rebound. It was, it was tough. You just, the you just make this. Yeah, I just think if you make that save, like I wasn't, I didn't love it that that rebound was so open to go in the net. But I just thought, geez, he he just you know you just stop that first shot. That's that, but then there was another sequence just a short time later, Bruce, where where his rebound led to three grade A shots right in a row, three five alarm shots actually, mm-hmm. right in a row, um, in tight. Yeah. And there was other like it just it it, it would hit him, and it, he just never seemed to make a clean save. It was always hitting him and then bouncing forward. 
And then, um, you know, Hannah Ryan Singh and I think both Louie and Han, like they're cheering for him. They're saying every time he makes a good play, it's all like, maybe he'll be like, that's a good moment. He could build it on his confidence. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. But it happened. Um, yep. He did. He did get his confidence going. You could see him as the game went along, getting more confident in the net and having better moments, ha- handling the puck, making clean saves. And uh, controlling his rebounds, which has been a rebounds. huge issue for him. Oh, my goodness. So, anyway, that was a good game. Like, um, you said, what would I give him? No, just based on process. You know, there were a lot of, there was 13 grade A shots, but he caused about three or four of them. So, uh, you know, my, my idea would be seven or an eight. I wouldn't give him a nine or a ten. This wasn't a particularly, there was lots of shots, but it wasn't a particularly difficult evening in net, especially after you know, the, the first period. And um, so I think he had a good game, maybe a great game um, for him. Well, he'll be getting an eight for me. No goalie gets a shutout without an eight. There you but go. but he did uh, I'm not sure. Game. I mean, the last game, uh, 10, was the correct score for Skinner, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, Kurt nailed it, because uh, Skinner was truly outstanding in that game from front to back. And uh, he faced a large number of... Uh, of highly dangerous shots in a very tense game against a very tough team. Now, the Anaheim Ducks, uh, they had it going on for a little while tonight, but I don't think you can say they're a very tough team uh, at this point in the season. I think they've lost their last seven straight games, and uh, it's uh, I think not, look, not looking pretty. They're the worst team that I've seen, I think, this year. Um, the um, So my good thing, Bruce... Mm-hmm. is Evander Kane, um, who just, um, he was just so good this game. And it was his play, actually, in the first period that I think um, got the Edmonton Oilers going. Uh, Leon Dreisato was driving the puck up the boards, and um, Kane, uh, Dr- Dreisato got hauled to the ice, by Frank Vetrano, and I th- initially I thought it was worse. I was worried it was going to be another Mikey Anderson situation where dry uh-huh. subtle legs, like where he got slew. I thought he might have been slew footed, and his leg caught under him, but that didn't happen. His feet went forward, fortunately, and he was no worse for wear um, after that hit. But Kane took exception for it, and f- <laughs> first he goes after Vetrano, right at Vetrano, and smashes him into the boards. And then someone, um, I think it's Benoit, who comes to Vitrano's aid. And <laughs> Kane oh, essentially wow. throws him to the ice, grabs him by the face, and throws him to the ice. It was it was, it was, was everything good about Evander Kane as an enforcer, as an intimidator, mm-hmm. was on that play. He's coming to the aid of a teammate. He's taking a penalty, but it's not a stupid penalty. It's exactly the kind of penalty you want to see where someone's standing up for his teammate. And it was... And, it, and it's after that moment that the Oilers start to come alive in this game and uh, never look back. And they, they, I think they score their first goal um, shortly after that. So um, just so Kane was involved. That whole line, Dry Subtle, Yamamoto, and Kane, was by far the Oilers' most dominant line this game. Yep. It was quite a find in that game. Yet, uh, Jay Woodcroft has been moving his lines around, trying different players. He's going to be, I think, be very tempted to stick with that line yeah. um, going into the playoffs because Kane, both Kane and Yamamoto have been struggling to find their games. Yes, looks like in the last few games though that both of them have found their A, not just like their B or their B plus game, but they right. both of them have found their A game again. Mm-hmm. For Yamamoto, it's actually a longer period of time. It's almost a month that he's been playing better and better and better. And mm-hmm. tonight he was really good. And then and and Kane was just. Uh, dangerous all night long, getting off great shots, combining well with Leon Dreisaitl, looking for Dreisaitl, combining with Dreisaitl, setting up Dreisaitl, having Dreisaitl set up him. Mm-hmm. Um, he only got the um, the one assist, but um, just a great, uh, fantastic five, sh- five shots on net for Kane, and most of them are pretty dangerous. Like, yeah. You know, I think a one in the late in the third period where Yamamoto – Won the puck battle in the corner and got it to, to dry sidle on the uh, uh, on the sideboards, and he immediately whipped a backhand pass right across the slot to Kane, and and, and Kane was ready for it, and he just slammed it on net. That was a real tough stop for Eunice Donsk. No, not what's that guy's name? 
Don Lucas, Tal. Lucas, I got him mixed up with Eunice Donstoy. Lucas Dostal. And he uh, he's the guy that stoned Edmonton with 46 saves the last time Anaheim was here 15 weeks ago today when they beat the Oilers 4-3. to But uh, no such luck today for... Uh, uh, for them, but their goalies did make some saves along the way, or this could have been a double-digit score. He was Kane was in on actually uh, at even strength. Kane was in on ten grade A shots, wow. made a major contribution to ten grade A shots, nice. and not a mistake on a grade A shot against. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he's gonna. I don't know, like he. he oh, I'm he, giving him a high grade. Nine. I thought he was excellent in this game, and yeah, yeah, he was, uh, he, as you say, he went to bat for his teammate. And he's just playing this power forward game now. Now, if I there are times when I can't see the numbers, you know, get a good look at the. I just sort of see the build of the player, and I get them mixed up. Drysaddle and Kane, because they're both these huge hulking guys with pretty yeah. fast, you know. When they get when they get going, uh, sometimes I think it's you know the puck flies onto one of their sticks, and I think it might be uh, Leon, and it's a Vander, or vice versa. And then of course they got the little guy on their wing, and it's like watching. Uh, one of those dog walkers, you know, going out and they got two pit bulls and a chihuahua today. <laughs> and uh, Yamamoto's just living the life on that line. And I mean, he's all over that puck. And How about uh, two sharks and a piranha? <laughs> Bruce, what is your second good thing? Well, that's got to be Leon Dreisaitl. My goodness, what a game for him. Uh, another massive achievement with his third 50-goal 50, 50 season. And I actually talked about this as being in the realm of possibility on the broadcast before the game, saying, well, he only needs a hat trick, you know, to get to 50. And sure enough, Leon produces a hat trick, uh, uh, and he does so in in, uh, terrific form, scoring one at even strength, one on the power play, and one shorthanded, showing, you know, his range of of, uh, skills. Uh, And... A number of terrific passes that didn't re- result in goals, but could well have. How how was he for your grade A shots? Um, well, for sh- he, he he was in on twelve. I think twelve. Twelve. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's I awesome. just I just that's have glitched great. our our uh, game sheet somehow, so I'm just trying okay. to fix that as we talk, and I'll give you a, a more yeah. complete answer shortly. Okay, as long as but, it didn't uh, disappear. It didn't. That happened once, but we did yeah. get it back. <laughs> As you recall, and we did get it back. Yeah. Um, anyway, this this was uh, uh, <clears throat> he had he had a little bit of a rough time in the first period, as did many of the players on the team, and you probably got him down for three or four um, uh, grade A's against as well, and that's pretty fairly marginal plays, but where you know he was the closest guy or whatever, and 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 the, yeah. the shot resulted nothing sort of egregious coughs up the puck for breakaway or any of that kind of stuff anyway uh, uh he made up for all of that by scoring uh scoring three times mm-hmm. getting his 50th at home for the first time in his career after uh, the first two times doing it on the road in calgary uh in 2019 and in anaheim last season but well, 350 goal years i mean man that's uh uh that's spectacular. Uh, I'm trying to think now. I'm, on Edmonton, I think that makes him number three. Uh, Gretzky had eight, and Curry had four, and Leon had three. I think Anderson had two. I may. I, I'm going to double check on Anderson. He might have snuck a third one in on me. And uh, Messier had one, and Coffee the bum only got to 48 goals playing defense, which of course is the all-time record for goals by a defenseman in a season. Uh, but we're now get, living in a day, David, where we're finally legitimately able to talk about the modern Oilers uh, and compare them to the dynasty or, Oilers in terms of w- what an offensive machine they've become. Right? The Oilers, I mean, you talk about talk about Leon scoring even power play shorthanded tonight. The Oilers lead the league in goals. They lead the league in power play goals. And they lead the league in shorthanded goals. Yeah. You know, <laughs> not bad. And... They're really starting to run, you know, they lead the league uh, after their last game. They were 25 goals clear of the second team in the NHL. And then they pump home another six tonight. So uh, it's uh, the offensive uh, 
uh, capacity of this team is uh, just stunningly good right now. I mean, obviously, McDavid is leading the charge and with another fine game tonight, goal assist. Uh, but he's got uh, 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 plenty of sco- scoring support. And it's uh, it's wonderful to see. Bruce, um, do you remember Drysaddle's first goal of the game? Sure do. What happened uh, on that play? Because that's the one that we've. Bl- I've, that there's oh, a glitch okay. on Kane, there. Kane fed him uh, a back a pass, and Drysaddle took it in, and he deked it, he deked the goal. He went to his backhand, and he roofed it or put it high oh, on the glove one. side. Okay. Yeah. And Yamamoto was in on that too, was he not? Uh, he or was he? Uh, Kane, it looked like it went to Yamamoto, but what really happened? I don't suppose they gave the assist to uh, uh, to Campbell because the puck came off of Campbell's blocker and uh, oh, that popped, out, one. popped out to uh, Kane. Yeah. Yamamoto yeah. swung and missed at it, and Kane took it most of the way down the ice, and then he fed it over to uh, Dryso. The order is the hometown scorekeeper was not very generous tonight. Uh, the nurse goal that was unassisted, I thought that was uh, that was a tough call. And I thought um, both Kane and uh, Dreisaitl potentially deserved an assist on that. The goalie did deflect the puck out of his crease back out to nurse. And then he just said like it was a turnover by the goalie. And all he did was kind of deflect it out of danger to less danger. But anyway, uh, it was... Uh, uh, and let's put it this way: It wasn't the guy in the fabulous form who used to give Marcel Dion a phantom assist every every couple of games just for fun. So these, these assists were all earned tonight, and there was a few more that I thought were earned that weren't given. So anyway, Bruce, my um, second good thing was um, the Oilers scorekeeper who you have just criticized. <laughs> Different because one. Because there was one key moment. Um, Drysaddle's power play goal in the second period, his mm-hmm. second goal of the game. Um, it really, it did happen within the allotted time for the power play, but it was initially marked down to be one second afterwards. And um, as we have both know, the orders are in the, the hunt to be the greatest power play of recorded history, which starts in, I think, 1976 Seven. or 77, yeah, something like that, uh, where they where they start to track power play goals. And um, so if that had not been counted as a um, as a power play goal, they, that would have been, you know, an even, if that would have been an even strength goal, would have, that would have been a, uh, a wasted power play opportunity against them, but that really helps them. And it was deserved, it, right? That that actually did happen within the last second of the power play, oh, yeah. which was a power play goal. Mm-hmm. And I just give them credit for being on the ball enough to recognize that and to pull that one second back off the clock mm-hmm. and uh, give Dry Settle credit uh, for a power play goal there, which will help the order's uh, power play percentage overall this season. They're um, They're doing pretty good here. Um, I don't think the NHL is updated yet, so I can't uh, maybe by the end of the podcast to be able to update exactly where they are with this. But um, yeah, I think, uh, I think one for uh, three tonight, technically, because they got that little that short one late. So they, they won't uh-huh. change very much from 32 points. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, they uh, that one. I mean, I went back and I watched and it was still 816 when he tucked it in and the clock rolled over one. So, yeah. And I, I'd like to know from an insider, and I maybe may know just the person to ask. <clears throat> My friend Al Robertson, who was a minor scorekeeper in uh, Edmonton for 42 years. Uh, but this year, I've seen a case where the Oilers scored a power a goal two minutes into a power play, and it was called even strength. And last week, there was one where they scored two minutes into a power play, and it was awarded as a power play goal. Both yeah. times, like the official time was two minutes. So I wonder if they run the clock where they have the tenth of the second thing going all the time, but they don't show it. And so maybe one was 159.8 and the other one was two minutes, point two seconds or something. Because there, there literally were two that were on the score sheet, two minutes exactly. And one was a PP goal and one wasn't. So there must be some, some uh, 
secret handshake or something that ex explains what's going on there. All right, let's move on, Bruce, to our bad things. What is your bad thing? Yeah, I wasn't thrilled with the with the first period, but I have to say, for most of the game, I was not particularly thrilled with the the line of um, uh, Nick Bugstad between uh, Warren Fogel and um, Matthias Janmark. They they all had a, a moment here or a moment there, but man, oh man, they spent a lot of time in their own end of the sheet, not getting the puck out and not, uh, you know, not only not generating anything, but kind of uh, chasing the play or uh, uh, not chasing hard enough the play or something. And they absolutely got stomped on the shot clock. I mean, Fogel, uh, you know, uh, four shots, four, 11 against five shot attempts for 17 against and Bugstad was saying five 17 on shot attempts and three 11 on shots and turning the puck over. And I thought in Bugstad's case, and maybe he was the key to it. Uh, it just seemed slow. And it was one of those game, big man with heavy legs kind of game. And all the big men have them occasionally. And it's just, they got up out of the wrong side of bed or whatever. And for whatever reason, they're just, just sluggish and slow reacting that game. And that's how I saw uh, Bugstad in this game. And I like Bugstad. I think he's a good player, but I don't think he had a good game tonight. And I don't think his mates really did either. I mean, Fogel, he got that one breakaway chance, which of course he didn't put in. And <laughs> otherwise... Um, like there was a play, first last minute of the first period when you you've sort of just stolen this one nothing lead after playing a poor period, and twice in the last minute Warren Fogel failed to clear the puck out of his own zone from a pretty favorable position, and twice he coughed it up at the blue line, and they wound up getting you know shots out of that, and I think one one uh, uh, grade A shot at least in the in the last minute. Mm -hmm. And it just was, you know, a little bit poor puck management. And I'll just say that line, it wasn't, this wasn't one of those games where everybody in the team was flying because that whole line kind of wasn't. And they're a big part of the reason why Jack Campbell faced as many, many pucks as he did. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Fog Janmark made a couple of nice passes, mm -hmm. um, first to Fogel and then to Shore in the third period where Shore almost scored. He was in there. Was that Yammer? Yeah, okay on the penalty kill. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, you're right. With the with the bigger players, this is an issue where um, they're not always, uh, you know, they're just not always firing on all cylinders. That goes for all the players out there. Most of the orders were. I was. Mm -hmm. this is another game. I was really impressed with Darnell Nurse, for yeah, instance. He was terrific. He's Again. just uh, he's starting to really round things up now it turns out my bad thing is darnell nurse not the way he played but a play he was involved in i think there was about six minutes left in the third period if i'm not mistaken and um it's the power at the decks fogel gets a penalty and um nurse is on the pk and they're trying to say they're trying to get campbell his shot out right mm -hmm. so instead of maybe letting a shot through Nurse decides to, uh, there's a one-timer shot, and it's, it's a really hard, it's a wicked shot by Vetrano who can really fire the puck. And it's going to go by Nurse, but because he's trying to preserve that shutout, I think he's doing anything he can to block that shot. Or maybe it was self-preservation. He's trying to not have him hit him in the face, which was also a possibility on that shot. Sure but it hits him in the palm of the hand. And when I saw that, I was just like, oh, God. No, no. Like that hurts so. Like mm -hmm. it, that. I don't know why he wasn't writhing on the ice. I don't know why he doesn't have a broken hand. Because there's no padding there. He took a slap shot on the palm of his hand. But somehow, he didn't even notice. It seemed like he didn't even notice it because he got right up and started to carpet the referee over something. And I was so glad to see that because I mm -hmm. thought, oh God, this is the last thing we need for the second year in a row for on a nothing play around the net for Darnell Nurse to get injured because yeah. this is what happened last year with about yeah. three or four games left. So yep. I just was so March relieved, 28th. but, and I, and I, I understand why he's going down to block that shot, trying to block that shot, trying to help Campbell get the shutout, which is big psychologically for the goalie. And mm -hmm. 
Um, it was, it's a big moment in the season in a certain way, but it would have been a much bigger moment in the season if Darnell Nurse had been injured. It would have been a freaking disaster. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm glad that didn't happen. And and um, it's just one of those things. It's hockey players get injured and fortunate. And, you know, they, they take risks all the time. It's a, it's a rough, physical, dangerous game. And he took a risk there and he, and he survived it. So I'm very glad about that. At least I hope he did. Yeah. Yeah, well, I saw it play a little bit different from you, David, uh, and I can tell you why Nurse was carping on the referee, and that was because as the puck was coming over to Vitrano for the one-timer, the Anaheim guy that Nurse was battling with in front, I don't know who it was, he cross-checked Darnell in the shoulders, and he knocked him in towards the line of fire of the shot. Uh-huh. Darnell threw his hand up because I think he did fear getting, you know, he could have got a full slap shot in the face there, and that could have been all kinds of trouble. And he kind of threw his hand up. I think maybe rather than hitting the palm, it might have hit the, you know, the hard pad on the thumb. That must have been and, what it, where it hit. Bruce. And it just and it just kind of popped off because he was sort of saying, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay. But in the meantime, he was, he was giving it to the ref pretty good because he'd been, you know, He'd been cross-checked and and basically put into the line of fire and uh, and in one universe that's a dirty play what the guy did and uh, Darnell he was probably already pretty cross from a play earlier in the third period where he got a penalty about for what they call it holding about ten seconds after the guy grabbed uh, guy settled by the name bar and wrenched him to the ice and Dar- and they took the puck the other way and Darnell stood the guy up and he did probably kind of hold him you know just kind of kind of kind of kind of stopped him gaining the zone a little bit and battled him and they called that after not calling the obvious tackle of uh, of dry of dry sidle. and so he was he was when he went off for that penalty, he was just utterly bemused with the ref saying, how can you call that when you didn't call that? You know, you could see the gesticulations, what he was saying. And then a few minutes later, he got in harm's way, uh, not through any design of his own. So I think that that was a self-preservation play. But, I mean, could it could have hit him in the face or could have hit him in the hand. Or, you know, I mean, there's been two guys. I mean, Ryan O'Reilly, he took a puck in the hand a while back and he was out for six weeks. I mean, that's what yeah, happens. So do you think Bruce, So thanks for that extra context. I didn't I hadn't I knew he was mad, but I was just I was just focused on trying to That's see fine. where it hit him. So you do you think you would have tried to block that? Like from what you could tell, could you even tell would he have tried to block that shot if he hadn't been cross checked to the ice or is it <sighs> He, he was cross checked into the line of the shot, yeah. and it was just a quick really high that. cross. It's hard to tell what what he would what he have designed done. to yeah. do, but a shot coming in that high and hot. I, I mean, there's not much, once you made up your mind, there's not much you can do to get out of the way. But it was, uh, uh, I don't think. I mean, he wasn't planning to move into the line of fire, but in the end, he did. And when he went down, I was like, you, oh no, no. Because the last thing you want, especially in a game like this in, in garbage time, is somebody suffering a serious injury. And it could have happened, but it didn't. So in the end, to me, it's not a bad thing, but it sure could have been a bad thing. Yeah. And congratulations to Darnell Nurse. Mm-hmm. Um, he set a new career high for points in a season with 42 um, this year. And um, he's also uh, got first 30 even strength points. His previous high was 23. So, um, you know, he's just not getting used that much on the power play this year. And, um, but he's just, he's uh, he's getting it done at even strength. And, you know, I, I do that ranking at the end of every year where I look at defensemen and just basically look at their power play production, their even strength uh, point production. And then I look at usage, how the coach has trusted them in different situations. Mm-hmm. And it gives you a very strong even though the statistical analysis isn't that sophisticated it gives you the right defensemen who are the best defensemen in the league like it'll give this year you know it'll be the usual suspects with you know Kale McCarr, Roman Yossi, Victor Hedman all of the best defensemen will be right near the top of the list and even though it's a crude method of looking at defensemen I defy anyone to come up with just not just give me your list of statistics that you're going to use to define the best defensemen and find a list that passes the smell test better because I I don't I've not been able I've been monkeying around with various statistics to to try to figure out what is the best group of numbers to rate defensemen 
And this seems to be the way. Anyway, uh, Darnell Nurse has ranked in the top 10 the last two years in this. So he's a true number one defenseman by this metric, which seems to really identify the defensemen who are the real number ones in the NHL. And he's going to be in that in the top 10 again this year, I'm almost certain, just based on how much the coach trusts him in overtime and shorthanded situations at even strength with ice time, and then his point scoring at even strength. Now, his power play total is going to drag him down. That's one thing that will drag him down because I don't There's know if he's got any. Power play total, so. he's, he's got one power play one point this year. First yeah. game of the season. Yeah, so that's going to that's gonna hurt him in this because I do have a separate category. That is yep. one of the categories. Cause, yep. um, so that, But he, I, I suspect he's going to be in the top 10, and he would be on Team Canada. If there was a Team Canada this year, Darnell Nurse would – definitely so, be on Team Canada. so I know he gets a lot of criticism not so much from us but um he, he's a well, hell of a hockey player and I just hope you, he has a great playoff don't you know that that the only reason he gets all those minutes is that because he plays on Edmonton as opposed to being on a real contender <laughs> I keep hearing that I keep hearing oh, that yeah. uh, so yeah. The last time I looked, David, he's in the, in the top 32 in the league and sometimes way, way higher, like in the top 10, but the top 32 in the league, games played, uh, minutes played, goals, uh, sorry, uh, uh, goals, points, uh, even strength goals, even strength uh, uh, points, uh, plus penalty minutes and giveaways. But, you know, it's because of those giveaways, man. He gives the puck away a lot. You know what? So does Dreisaitl and McDavid. But, <laughs> That's true. You know, the guys who give away the puck a lot are the guys who handle it a lot. You know what defenseman give away the puck the most this year? Eric Carlson. Does that mean he stinks? I don't think it does. Yeah. I think it tells us that giveaways are a proxy for how many times a guy handles the puck and tries to do something with it. So, Bruce, your yeah. number. Yeah, uh, well, I'm going to go with this sweet line uh, that's now updated at NHL.com. Leon Dreisaitl, 75 games played, 50 goals, 70 assists, 120 points. Comes out for a line of round numbers. Third time for 50 goals, of course. The 70 assists is a career high. 120 points is a career high. And we've still got... uh, or is it six more games, five more games to go in the season now? To he'll get to 80, I hope, and because uh, uh, he missed two games right around New Year's, and otherwise, uh, and he toughed it out for a whole bunch more games, and he's still got 120 points. And all of a sudden, it looked like the other guys were overtaking him there for a while, and now all of a sudden, he's 14 points clear of third place uh, Nikita Kucherov. And it seems pretty obvious that Edmonton will be 1-2 in league scoring for, will this be the third time in the last uh, four years? I think so, because Leon came first and Connor second in the 2019-20 season. And then in the uh, in the silo season, the 56-game season, Connor got 105, Leon got 84. And the guy in third was 69, I think, that time. And then last year, um, Connor came first again, but Leon was 34th at the end. He had a, a little slide just before the end of the season, and he got overtaken by a couple guys. And this year, no slide. He's just his game is coming up and up and up. And uh, he's uh, basically since the beginning of March, since the day Yanmark arrived. That, that coincidentally or not, that was the game. And beginning of him really turning around and getting serious about playing 200 foot hockey and and piling the points you know that um mcdavid and drysaddle were the first two of the nhl's three stars of the month good they well, Leon- three stars of the month and they almost always give it to three different teams because they want different teams to have bragging rights you know they took like to spread it around but those guys were just so far and away above everybody else and, you know they could have given Nuge the third star of the month and not been wrong <laughs> they should dry saddle should finish second in the um in the heart trophy voting um i think I, I i don't see anyone else who's had the season he has had 
Um, Bruce, my number is related to the line of Yamamoto, Dreisaitl, and Kane. And um, so the Oilers had 27 grade A shots. That line had more than half of them. Mm -hmm. Kane had five grade A shots, Dreisaitl had five, and Yamamoto had four. They had 14 of the 27 grade A shots for the Oilers. So, yeah, I just think it's, you know, with the arrival of Ekholm, with the play of DeHarnay, with Dreisaitl, Becoming the dry saddle we know uh, is there as a center. Uh, I think the orders are going to win the Stanley Cup. And I just want, I, I've been saying that for some time now, Bruce. And I just wonder what you think about it now. Like you've been watching this team in the last little while. Do you think, would you say, would, would you say that you're, they're your favorites to win the Stanley Cup at this point? Or what, what would be your uh, take on it? Mm. I don't know about favorites, but they're, they're certainly among the uh, favorites going in. I mean, I've been looking this week, like because they were playing the Kings, I looked back, did that retrospective about how they'd play, done since the last time they played the Kings when they lost and they had all those fights. And and uh, the next day, uh, DeHarnay joined the team. And since Vinny came in the lineup on January 11th, they've had the best record in the NHL. And that's like nearly three months. It's not like a, you know, a short little spurt. And I realized that the start date's kind of artificial, but just in March alone, like March 1st to 31st, that's not artificial at all. They had the best record in the NHL. And they had, uh, uh, you know, they, they're they bringing it, they're bringing the offense big time. And they're, I mean, back-to-back shutouts now. And I mean, obviously they're not works of art, 79 shots against, uh, but they're, they're, they picked up their defensive play. Uh, they picked up their, you know, their their uh, overall domination of play. Uh, they got a coach that's really pushing the buttons and saying, you know, I still don't think we've played a, a complete game, put everything together yet. He's always thinking they can do even better than they've been doing. And how they've been doing? 9-0-1 in their last 10. 9-0-1 yeah. in their last 10. That um, that game against the Kings, I think they found the the game they needed to find a win in the playoffs. You know, the dump and thump hockey, where they are going to face teams that are just going to play completely negative hockey. They're going to park the bus on the blue line, mm-hmm. and um, so. yeah. and the owners are going to have to dump it in. But they, to me, that was a such a key moment for this franchise. You know, last year in the playoffs was the first key moment where they didn't where they just showed they can play with incredible defensive intensity game six against the Kings and they won that game and then game seven. And now they're showing that they can figure out a way to grind out a game, a win against a a team, which is a superior defensive team, a very good defensive team um, by playing that style of hockey. Um, And I, the the reason I think they're going to win the cup is be, is because of McDavid and Dressel beating at the peak of their games and leading their own lines. And I just don't think those two players will be denied, as Jack, uh, Jack uh, Michaels denied, likes to be. I just don't see it, Bruce. I, it, so as long as this, these the key players on the order stay healthy and they get, um, let's say, above average to good goaltending, they'll win the Cup this year. And um, I think at least, the, you know, there's lots of good, I know there's, and I know there's many good teams in the NHL, but when you get players playing at the level these two guys are, are playing at right now, mm-hmm. I'm very, very bullish on the Edmonton Oilers. I like, I like their chances for sure. I mean, there's, there's so much randomness in hockey and it can, you know, things can yes. come apart so fast in a playoff series. It can be just the wrong opponent or the wrong guy gets hurt or, you know, there's, you know, something happens um there's puck luck you know i mean and lots of, you know you like to think over seven games series the better team's going to win but the fact is that there's margins between the teams is pretty razor thin so uh there's a reason that you know the president's trophy winner has not won the cup for the last nine years in a row or like <clears throat> it's it, it's you can say well they're the best team they should win but it doesn't necessarily work out that way so i'm i'm cautiously optimistic i do think that uh orders have a real good team right now and they've uh, they've done some some made some real positive steps this year so i, so I don't think um 
ranking the team from the moment that Harnay arrives is a bad idea, actually. It's one of the key moments in the season because up until then, they had no one um, fulfilling that Chris Russell role on the PK, like a shutdown PK guy. And they had, and their physical presence on the PK was also really lacking. So he's really filled a key role in his own way, even though he doesn't play a lot every game. The minutes he does play, especially on the PK, are abs- utterly crucial. And he's done a, an excellent job with them. So th- that was the, you know, one of the, one of the, you know, there's a few key moments. The whole, for sure. the, you know, there's Costin joining the team, um, playing well. There's DeHarnay, and then there's the, you know, the Ekholm uh, trade, and then there's Drysaddle coming alive as his off of McDavid's wing, completely leading his own line. And now the the latest thing is Kane and Yamamoto, um, their games uh, perking up. You know, from the start of the season, there's been Nugent Hopkins and Hyman, their games uh, taking off. So um, there's been a lot of, there's a lot of up arrows. Yes. That way, Bruce, there's a lot of up arrows. And there's not, other than the goaltending, you know, there's not that many questions. But the goaltending is a question, you know. So we'll see. Back to back shutouts, man. Both back to back shutouts. Yeah. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. There's certainly lots of up arrows. Lots and lots of up arrows. Yeah. And there's enough depth on the team now that they, they can survive a game where not everybody's at top of their game. They have different people that can step up to be the hero uh, from from uh, one night to the next. And such depth in scoring. I mean, here tonight we got, uh, of course, Dry Saddle with three, including his 50th. But we've also got Hyman with the 34th, uh, Nurse with his 11th from the blue line, and McDavid with his <clears throat> 62nd of the season, uh, tying Wayne Gretzky's total from 1986-87, which was the last where it hits the 60 mark. And so we're we're seeing stuff that we haven't seen around here for a very long time. Indeed. All righty, Bruce. Well, you got to write the game grades tonight. Let's I do. Uh, let you go and uh, get at it. So, thanks for talking tonight. Oh yeah, one uh, last little thing, which people already know, probably L.A. three, Seattle one, Vegas four, Minnesota one. So yeah. Oilers made up no ground, and of course the calendar ticked down one game closer to the end of the season. So first place is uh, they're going to need some help at some point to get there, but. Uh, they're certainly making it interesting. So uh, good on them. Thanks for talking, Bruce. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.